The main reason I came to this, this area is because no building restrictions whatsoever. That's really hard to find in this country. There's just no building restrictions out here, uh, you know, in South Brewster County, um, which is uh, pretty miraculous, actually, because the population is really tiny out here. It's cheap to live out here as well. I started with a 40-acre tract, it was $8,000. And this, the 20-acre tract I bought south of me was $500. I came out here to get away from debt. I was deep in debt and the mortgage on the on the house I had was was pretty steep. I was going to become a statistic if I wasn't careful and I, luckily I was able to sell the place and walk away with a, a chunk of change to go somewhere and start simple. Yeah, I got this doghouse for my chickens, hoping they'd start going in there. And they're, they're sort of spending some time in there, but they sleep all night right on my porch in front of my door. Hey, chickies. So Anything. is this your house? Or this is my house. All uh, 128 square feet of it. When I first moved out here almost seven years ago, I was a set builder in New York City for a number of years, and I used those skills to build the basic box in my house in a week and put it together and moved in and that took three months to do all the finish work with the second roof and the metal siding and the interior. One of the tricky things out here is shade of course. I did this sort of double roof thing on my house. You know there's actually an insulated waterproof cover on the, on the top of my box of a building that I live in and then I've got a, a foot above that is this other metal roof that adds shade air can pass through there and help suck any heat off of it. And it really makes a big difference as far as not cooking yourself in the summertime out here. So this is my outdoor shower. Um, it had a door on it, but it blew off in the last storm. Uh, we get some pretty heavy winds out here and uh, my door blows off usually twice a season and I haven't rebuilt it yet. So, Which out here doesn't really matter if you have a door or not. And how does it work? Well, the, there's a tank on top, there's an insulated box on top, and there's glass on the south side and on the top of it, insulated glass. And it's just an old steel tank from a hot water heater. And I manually fill it. I climb the ladder here and fill it because I don't use that much water out of here. This panel on the side here is, is a thermal siphon, which basically helps heat it up faster in the winter time. It's disconnected right now, so it's not really doing anything, but when the sun's lower in the winter and it beats down on this panel here, this gets really hot and it naturally cycles the water without any pumps or anything, hotter and hotter inside the tank. In the summertime, you never take a shower at the end of the day because the water's way too hot. You wait till the first thing in the morning. Of course, out here, when you live by yourself, you don't have to shower that often because if there's no one to smell you, do you, you know, really stink? When I first moved out here, the cheapest deal on solar panels, you know, there was 45 watts of, of solar. Three of these panels was one set. That was about $4.50 a watt. Now, solar you can get for under a dollar a watt. These run my lights and my swamp cooler. It's such a tiny house, I have a fan running 24 hours a day in the house just to circulate air through there. I left uh, my house in upstate New York when I moved out here. That house was 2,800 square feet. So I've gone from 2,800 to 128. My house in upstate New York, it was a big farmhouse built in 1845. There was an upstairs bathroom and a downstairs bathroom. There were four bedrooms upstairs. <coughs> now I used 10% of the house most of the time. <coughs> I had to buy all this furniture just to put stuff in each of these rooms that I never went into. So you're in the foyer and the kitchen right now. Then we have a long hallway and there's a bedroom on the right and an office, living room, dining room on the left. Wow. And you know, it's funny, I lived in, in Manhattan for maybe 12 years and I never had an apartment anywhere this small. 
when I lived in Manhattan. I always had, I think the smallest was 350 square feet. So this is 128 square feet. Of course in Manhattan, this would probably cost you $1,000 a month in rent for something this size. I cook down here. There's a propane tank under the counter and it's just a, you know, a regular burner thing. You turn it on, you have to light it with a match. And I have a solar oven I use occasionally as well, but uh, simple stuff like soups and pasta and stuff I just cook in here on this little propane grill top. Everything's so simple here. You know, I was busting my ass seven days a week just to pay all the bills for all the stuff I had. And uh, now it's pared down to one room. I've got a huge yard, you know, with all this land. I can't see another house from my property, which is another big plus. There's no, well, there's very little stress out here. The only time I get stressed out here is when there's a big storm, because storms are scary out here in the desert. You know, it's like, you know. What do you do for refrigeration? I've got a, a chest freezer that's regular 110 volt AC. I run it off my solar stuff. I just use it as a refrigerator. As long as you keep it packed full of stuff, it doesn't take much to keep it cold. Yeah. Yeah, we got our cheese in here. <laughs> With a chest style, you open the lid, all the cold doesn't come pouring out. So I just turn it on for maybe an hour a day and then turn it off and then it keeps everything cold. I can even make ice if I turn it on for four hours and pack some stuff in the bottom, it'll ice it up. So it works, works good enough. It's funny, I built these cabinets originally and didn't have doors on them. And then I started chucking all my stuff into them and I thought, I don't want to look at all that stuff. So I spent like a week making all these doors and sealing everything up. And it's just OSB, board oriented strand board. It's like plywood, basically. It's cheap, cheap plywood. This is my favorite one right here. This is my ammo cabinet. Being in New York City, I was never much of a gun person, of course, but when I came out here, you know, a 911 call is maybe 45 minutes before somebody calls you back to make sure there's an emergency and then another 45 before they get here. So I have eight guns now and a bunch of bullets and stuff. And, but everything, it's all OSB. It's all, yeah. yeah. And you know, there's insulation in the walls and in the ceiling. This is held up pretty good inside. You know, this is almost seven years old that I've been in here, so. Um, when I moved out here, I, I knew I could get my phone line brought out to me, but I wasn't sure about the, the DSL, and I was close enough to still get that as well. So I have a landline and DSL. You know, people will correspond with me and say, it sure looks lonely out there. Isn't that a lonely place? And I say, well, places aren't lonely. Only people are lonely. It's funny, when I was a little kid, I used to think that when I grew up, I was going to be a hermit. And then I moved to upstate New York by this giant house, because I think that's part of the American dream, and then discover it's going to kill me to try to pay for this. There's no way I can afford it. So I sell that, and I come out here and start from scratch with this space. And it's kind of like, I think I'm fulfilling that prophecy of the hermit thing, except it's not like the traditional sense of being a hermit. It's more. It's more living in the world and not being of the world. And I think a lot of people choose to live in a smaller space like this, to live not beyond your means. This is the timer circuit for my swamp cooler. It pumps water through the swamp cooler every like four or five minutes. And uh, that's what keeps it cooler in here. It, it's coming in right through this window here. There's four fans blowing right in through here. Yeah, that was the lifesaver the first summer. I discovered it gets really hot in the desert. I researched swamp coolers a little bit and I found some 12 volt options that were over $500 and I thought I could build one for probably $100 and I think mine cost about $85 the first one I built. There's a, a little bilge pump in here and I, I fill this with water and the bilge pump is hooked up to a timer so every couple of minutes it turns on and pumps water up into this little reservoir here which drips it through this evaporative pad here and then the excess comes back down and back into the bucket. I have to fill this up twice a day on a really hot day when it's running all day long. It's a swamp cooler, they call them. They're also known as evaporative coolers. Now, they only work in, in areas with really low humidity. If there's 
If it's more than 25% humidity, these don't work at all. So, okay, so you just got a couple coolers, or what, how does it work? Yeah, I got work? a couple of coolers. I, I mean, I knew basically how a swamp cooler worked. You have to have fans that suck air through a, a pad of some kind. Now, and the water drips through the, from the top. It sort of soaks this pad, and this is actually a cardboard pad. It's really thick. It's about four inches thick. This gets soaked with water, and as the air is getting pulled through it, the air evaporates some of that water as it's passing over it, and that's, that's where you get the cooling effect, where it cools down. It's 101 right now in the shade. The most I've ever seen is a 25 degree difference between the ambient air temperature and what the evaporation is doing to the air. You know, I could actually put a small window unit air conditioner in here and run it off some solar. You know, my solar stuff is pretty minimal. It's, it's not, you know, there's people out here that have huge systems that, you know, cost them $10,000 to put in. And they can live just about the way anybody lives, you know. They can have a toaster oven and a curling iron and a microwave and a freezer and a refrigerator and all that stuff. And, you know, I don't really need all that stuff. Well, you know, the reason for the phone is when they ran my phone line out to me, they actually made this driveway for me and placed the box for the phone right, <clears throat> right behind it here. And somebody almost ran this over a couple of times before the greenhouse was here and anything else. And I thought, well, I should block this with something. And I figured, well, a phone booth would be the perfect thing. So. This building, which was part of my grand scheme when I came out here, was to create this giant greenhouse courtyard thing with shipping containers. I spent four and a half years building this by myself. I'm trying to get two containers ready to be cleaned out and insulated and closed off. And I'm going to move into one of them eventually and, and have another one as an office and workshop space. This one was going to be my house. And then this, I was thinking this would be like an office and a workshop. But now I'm almost thinking that I don't really need an office and a workshop because I've got all this area out here, so I'm, I'm not sure what. I am thinking of putting an, an indoor shower in. One thing I discovered, I discovered I was a much better builder than I was a farmer. Basically, I've created a, a restaurant in the middle of the desert, so any bug that knows about it is going to come in here and start eating plants. This is an orange tree right here. Uh, this is a fig. That's the grapefruit. And then there's another fig. This is a pomegranate here. No pomegranates this year. The idea is to try to grow as much food as I can in here, but I've discovered in the two years I've been sort of playing with some plants, I need to climate control an area of this more than just some fans and stuff. You know, I've got these shade screens here to shade out a lot of the sun. It's just too bloody hot. I think in this framed area here, I'm going to section off with some plastic and actually put uh, either an air conditioner and or a swamp cooler on it and that can run off solar. Just have a small zone that's protected and cooled. That way I can get a uh, few more things to eat. <laughs> so these cutouts on the shipping containers um, I made, there's going to be a big glass door here eventually and the same on this one. Actually cutting was really easy. It actually took me maybe five minutes to cut that out. I used a, a cutting wheel on a, on a grinder. One thing I discovered sort of once I got started and got all these containers I call it the 10 reasons not to use shipping containers. And uh, the main reason is this, this whole thing has become so popular now that the prices of these is just skyrocketing. You know, if you have a big truck and a trailer and you can drive to a port city, you can pick up a 40 footer for probably $800. But if you buy it through a broker, it's going to cost you five, $6,000 to get it delivered to you. So these cost $3,400 each, including delivery. You know, for that amount of money, I could build a structure the size of four of these, as substantial as these are. And you're starting with a metal box. You've got to do a lot of work to it to make it livable, because it's a friggin' oven in the summertime, and it's an ice box in the wintertime. And you really got to insulate it good and shade it. And of course, mine are all sort of attached to each other because of this roof system and the, the way they're you know, built into the foundation of the project here. Nice thing about them is they don't blow away. They're pretty heavy. If you could really just get these for 500 bucks a piece, it would be worth it. You know, I've got all the like the house projects in line now. I've got shipping container houses to do. I've got a big trailer to do a mobile house on maybe someday. It's really a feed trailer for now, but uh, 
You know, I got an Airstream to redo. My Airstream here was kind of an impulse buy a couple of years ago. I'd been kind of looking for one. I had an Avion in upstate New York, and I left it there when I sold the house, but that's where I sort of started my off-grid experiment. Been renting my house out to what we called city -its, you know, New York City people who wanted a weekend place for the summer. So this is the, this is actually just a closet. Throw extra stuff out of the way. I've got a bed in here. I throw a bunch of extra clothes in here. That's so what's your guest bedroom. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. Um, this one came up for a reasonable price. It's been gutted inside, and eventually I hope to redo the interior of this. Do you think you, you reach a point where you no longer want to be tinkering with things? And... Mm, no, I just need a break. Just like, oh, I just, I gotta take a break. I haven't been away from here in three years, other than, you know, like a day trip. If I stay here much longer, I'll never leave here ever again. The thought of traffic and lots of people just doesn't appeal to me at all anymore. And I joked over Christmas, I went up to Odessa Midland area to run some errands. I hadn't seen a stoplight in I don't know how long. And it was Christmas time and I thought at first they were just Christmas decorations because they, you know, blank red and green and, and stuff. So, you know, the closest stoplight to me is 160 miles away. Where my house is is basically the very center of a 40 acre tract, which is a quarter mile square. Uh, the southern border of my property is just this little ridge right here. And there's a road off to my right to the west here that you can't really see from here. The other direction, it's hard to say exactly where my border is over there, but uh, quarter mile square. I've got 100 acres total and I pay $300 a year in property taxes. What I pay for, per year here is what it costs me about every eight days to live in upstate New York. I was paying $1,000 a month in property taxes alone. And this is all bought and paid for, uh, you know, cash. I pay property taxes once a year. I dance into the property tax office every year to pay my bill because it's so low. The only rule that I know about here is if you have a permanent residence on 10 acres or less, you have to have a county approved septic or a county approved composting toilet. Where's your toilet? The desert is my toilet. I have a composting toilet. There's just a box here that's got a bucket in it with sawdust in it. And then you take the bucket with the sawdust and dump it into, I have a couple of bins where I just keep that stuff to compost. Yeah, you know, if you have a big city and everyone's just going out in their front yard and pooping, there could be a problem eventually. You know, out here, the idea of a toilet, a flush toilet, just makes no sense whatsoever. Yeah. Unless you've really got some gray water you can use to flush stuff down with. I know people out here that don't have enough rainwater catchment set up. They have to haul water just so they can flush their toilet. That's just crazy. These are some of my extra water tanks up here. The ones attached to my greenhouse, and I've got a little one on my house. These capture all the rain off the roof systems which is a little cleaner. It's not running through a creek or anything like that. And uh, my greenhouse roof actually gives me 1,500 gallons per inch of rain. I've yet to fill up all my tanks in a season because rain's been kind of spotty. Ideally, I only need about eight or nine inches of rain a year to fill everything up. Now these tanks, there's a little creek that runs right behind here when it rains really hard out here. So I use a gas pump and I pump out of this creek into these tanks. And this is just extra standby water. It fills up and it looks a little muddy, but it all sells out and it's clear looking. These are 3,000 gallon tanks. This one's about half full and uh, this one's full to the top. This is 1,500 gallon. This water is probably three years old in here. You can never have too much water catchment storage. I've got, my capacity is 21,000 gallons. Right now I have about 11,000 gallons on tap and it's only rained two inches in the past six months. The bike washer <laughs> My bike powered washing machine. Now this was a little project that I would thought about a lot when I first came out here. I gotta make a bike powered washing machine. So I finally did. Uh, I used it a couple times but it, these top loading style use too much water. You know a front loader uses a lot less because it just tumbles through and I think the belt, yeah, the belts even come off of it. So uh, the challenge was getting the drive to work right with the with the gear underneath. Because the belt underneath is, you know, this direction and this one's this direction. And I had to twist it and... 
Oh yeah, it's agitating. Oh, there goes the belt. <laughs> Did you make this? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I'd been thinking about it for a long time, and finally somebody had a washing machine they were getting rid of, and somebody had a bike. So I, I put the two together. And When I first posted some pictures of this and talked about it, people, did you invent that? And, you know, people have made bike-powered washing machines for years. And, uh, you know, it's hard to invent anything anymore these days. Someone's already thought of it. This is what I cooked most of my stuff with for the first couple of years. Uh, this would heat up to about 325 in here, but this big piece of glass that went on here, I finally broke. People are always asking me how you maintain the temperature in a solar oven. I bought one of these little dials, the oven dial, mm -hmm. and this just goes on the thing here. So that's how you control the temperature in a solar oven right there. I started a new solar oven that's supposed to give me about 450, and I've got huge reflectors that go on top. Basically the same idea, you just have it pointed at the sun, but this has a lot more surface area reflecting more sun into it. Hey chickens, come here Mr. Chicken. These girls are just about grown up enough to go free ranging. Well, there's two, two roosters and two hens. And you just built this out of foul materials or something? Yeah, this was, you know, pallets from the building supply place they give away. These sheets of metal that are on top here to protect them are cutouts I made off the shipping containers. When you come out here to, to live off grid, you really got to know what you're doing because if, if you don't, you're going to discover like so many people have who've come out here to try this. They come out and discover, you know, unless you're really prepared and you've got some money and you're willing to do the work yourself, you know, you're going to discover it really sucks out here. Before I sealed up my house, or the porch here, before I sealed everything up, I thought I'd run some piping through this slab, of con or through where the slab was going to go, under the house, and then into the house, and then I have vents at the top of my house with some little fans in it, so it, as they're sucking air off the ceiling, which is hotter, it would be drawing air in underneath the house through this little tiny zone that's that's got to be cooler because it's in the shade and it's under the mm. house. And it turned out to do nothing as far as climate control and all it really did was have a place where dust could get sucked into the house. So it was, it, I called it my micro geothermal air conditioning experiment that didn't work because it was just too micro. I don't know if the population's ever going to really grow out here because you know, people kind of like to have something to, you know, a place to plug in and then a place to turn on a faucet. That just doesn't happen out here. You know, actually, I have an elevator that goes down to an Olympic-sized swimming pool that's buried underground. But I'm not going to show you that. <laughs> you <see> that? <laughs> Got to be willing to do it yourself, which is perfect for me because that was my plan from the start.